you high and praise my God, O oh my King, and I will bless your name into eternity. I will bless you every day and keep it up from now until forevermore. God is magnificent. He can never be praised enough. There are no boundaries to his greatness. How marvelous and how wonderful is our Savior's love. This morning as we keep singing in praise and as, as, we, as we typically invite anyone to come up to the altar. And these altars are always open during the first song, during the last song, during the start. Uh, these altars are open and come forward and to pray. And I always like to, to encourage and, and remind everyone of that. Because this is what we do at church. We sing, we praise, we pray. This morning I'd like to introduce a new song with the team. And it's called Build My Life. And I'd, I'd like to share with you guys a little bit about what the, what the author said about the song. He said this, he said, Life rarely behaves with our plans. And it's usually in the uncertainty and the not knowing. The trials that reveal what we've been standing on and what we put our trust in. Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 6 and it says, It's like a man who built his house on the rock. When the storm came, the house withstood the storm. Really a reminder for us that we can build our life on anything. We have that freedom to choose, to build on whatever we want, but to build our life on a foundation that withstands the storms and the trials. The invitation of Jesus is to build our lives on what will last, to build our lives on a firm foundation.
Amen, people of God. Amen. As we come into our time of prayer, I'd like to just share with you uh, my gratitude for you all. Uh, remember two Sundays ago, uh, we, we, we asked Melissa, my wife, to come forward because the, the night before, we had found out that her sister-in-law, Patty, had died from an overdose. And so we placed hands on Melissa two Sundays ago, and we sent her down to Columbus, and uh, we sent her down with a mission, with a charge, a, a commission, if you will, to go and, and be light to her family, to be Christ in that situation. And that's what Melissa did. And I stayed up here with the kids, uh, went about pastoral ministry here, we had a board meeting that Tuesday, and I told the board that uh, the family had asked me to officiate the, the, the memorial service. And the board was gracious enough to say, Pastor, go down there. The, the, the funeral, the memorial service would have been Saturday late in the afternoon. They said, go down there, officiate the memorial service, and just stay there over through Sunday and be with your family and your extended family, with your wife's family. And I just want to say thank you, especially to you who are on the board, for giving me the freedom to do that. I know that the timing was very bad uh, with me just getting back, but um, I mean, we don't, we don't time these things, do we? This is life. And so for those of you who are uh, board members, I want to thank you for, for your flexibility. And so that's what I did. I went down and I officiated the, the memorial service and I preached about Christ. I preached about the hope that we have in Jesus. I preached about the resurrection of the Son of God. And I, and I encouraged this group of people, many of whom never stepped foot in church. Many of whom are dealing with substance addiction issues and, and themselves. And, and many of whom were, were angry, angry at the situation, angry at a whole, a whole host of things. I just encouraged them to, to ask the Spirit of God to fill their heart and to, to empty them of, of anger, of, of regret, of bitterness, and to fill their heart with mercy, love, and forgiveness. So as we come into this time of prayer, I think we need to be reminded of the weight of what we as a church are called to do. Because we live in a fallen world where people are so desperate and they need God, but they don't know it. They don't know that they're lost. They don't know that what they're missing is the Spirit of Christ in their hearts. They don't realize that, and so they go searching and striving for this and that. And but, but we as the people of God are called to come together in times like this and pray. And ask for the Spirit of God to use us, frail, faulty human beings, to bring light into this world. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And Lord, we think of the awesome responsibility that you have bestowed upon us, that you, that you have entrusted to us, and that is to be a people of prayer, to be a people of light in this dark world, this world that has fallen and so desperately needs you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you empower and equip us to be your people. To be a holy people, a people who live holy love day in and day out in their homes, their workplaces, in their communities. Oh, I think of the psalmist who says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from God. For Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our salvation. You are our fortress and we will never be shaken. Through all of the trials of life, through all of the circumstances that we encounter, we build our house on the solid rock of Christ. And because of that, and because of that alone, not our own wisdom, not our own skill, not our own strength, but because of you and who you are, we will not be shaken. And so we trust in you at all times. We pour out our hearts to you. God, for you are our refuge. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love, and we trust that you reward everyone according to what they have done. May we be a holy people and reach out to this, this community which so needs you. And Father, we pray for those needs in our community at 
just heard that we uh, have some folks who are who are not feeling well. I pray that you would uh, just heal the physical bodies. We pray for um, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Would your spirit of consolation be with them in this time? God, I pray for the ministries of First Church of the Nazarene. Would you help us to expand the daycare center, Lord? God, this daycare center is full of kids and, and, and teachers, and, and we are just bursting at the seams. Would you help us to expand? God, we need to put in some, some uh, sun shield shade system in the, in the back in the, where the kids play. And that's going uh, to be quite a, quite a project. Would you help us to fulfill that project? Lord, we thank you that we've been able to pay off the mortgage and we are debt-free. Thank you, God, for that. But we're also thinking about bringing on uh, someone to minister to the youth of this community. Lord Jesus, would you give us wisdom as we walk down that path? There are so many exciting things going on here in this local community of faith. I pray that you would lead us by your Spirit. Guide us, Lord. We pray in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How we are now debt free.
story of when I was a little kid about San Jose's actually, about San Jose's. Um, many of you know, most of you should know that uh, that that uh, my family lived in, lived in Nairobi, Kenya for a while, and uh, you know we ended up moving back to the United States and when I was about the same as age. And it was, that was kind of a rocky time in in the Wolford family. Raise your hand if you know that about my history. Good, a good amount of you do. Awesome. Um, finances were tight. I mean, they were really tight, and uh, I, I remember. I was going to school and it was starting to get hotter, you know, the, the weather, the seasons was changing, it was getting hotter, and, and I only had pants. I only had jean pants, that's all I had. I didn't have a single pair of shorts. And so uh, my, my dad <laughs> said, well, we can fix that. And so he cut my pants in the shorts. Voila, problem solved, right? So I went to school with these cut off jeans, and you know, I'm like, all right, it's not the best thing in the world. I wasn't really thrilled about it, but I, I wore what I could, what I had. Well, I'll never forget, my neighbor said to me and my sister, Katie, she said, hey, I'm gonna go with, uh, go with you guys and uh, we're gonna go to the store. So my sister Katie and I were like, all right. And so there's our neighbor and our, and our mom up in the front seat and there's Katie and me in the back seat. We go to the store and this store, I'm telling you folks, remember we just got back from Africa, money was tight, I wasn't used to Americana quite yet, okay? And I go to this glorious store full of bright lights and nice clothes, and it was called Kohl's. <laughs> I'll never forget Kohl's. And I was like, wow! So we go into the store, and our neighbor bought Katie some clothing item. I forget what that was. She bought me a pair of new shorts. And I remember on the, on the drive back from Coles <laughs> to our house, and I was holding my brand new pair of shorts. And how grateful I was that I didn't have to wear those cut off jeans anymore, but I could wear real shorts. I got them on, and I went to school, and I was so thrilled about well, fast forward a few months and even into years, that same neighbor would hire me to mow her backyard. It was a big backyard, but I loved mowing that backyard. To this day, I still like mowing our yard, right? I like mowing our yard. And she would, she would hire me on. She would give me a good wage to mow her yard. I was really, really blessed by this woman. Her name is Sherry. Her name is Sherry. And we still keep in contact on Facebook today. Even today. Why am I mentioning this? Think about it. That event, that simple event of her taking me to a clothing store and buying me a pair of shorts has stuck with me for 20 years. Plus, over 20 years. I still remember the feeling of gratitude I had. I'm going to give you all the bottom line up front, okay? The main point of the sermon, the bottom line up front is this. This is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. If you're taking notes, you can write it up in your little note-taking thing right here. The bottom line is I'm going to be encouraging you today to spend your money on people. Spend it on people. If you can, give a generous gift sometime this week to someone. In fact, Melissa, you and I owe it to Sayla's tutor. I've been thinking about it, I've been wanting to do it, and I keep forgetting it. Well, this week we need to do it. Alright? We need to give a generous gift to others. And if, and if you have the ability to, to be in charge of people's wages in some way or another, give a generous wage to people. And while you're at it, more broadly speaking, be someone of generous compassion towards those who need it. And be someone of generous hospitality toward others. That is the bottom line up front. Spend your money on people. Okay? Pastor, where are you getting this from? Getting it from Luke chapter 16, 
beginning in the first verse. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're in Luke 16, beginning in the first verse. Because remember, don't do it because I said it. Jesus told his disciples, as it's a parable for them, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. And so he called him in and he asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so he called in each one of his master's debtors. And he asked the first one, How much do you owe my master? Not 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. So then, then he went over to the second one and asked him, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, you replied. So he told him, take your bill, make it eight hundred. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so if, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Alright, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to walk through verses 1 through 8 of Luke 16 for a moment. Just to make sure we all understand what's going on. So there's this rich man. Jesus doesn't talk about who he is, but he's the boss, okay? Bob the boss. And he has a money manager, someone who manages his investments, his business. Oh, uh, let's call him Sleazy Sam, okay? So we've got Bob the boss, and he calls in Sleazy Sam, and he says to him, you're done. You've wasted my possessions. Now, how did he waste his possessions? Was it embezzlement? Was it fraud? Uh, was it just general waste? We, we don't really know, but we can we can tell by the rest of this story that Sleazy Sam <laughs> is not an honest person, right? And he's been found out. He's going to be fired. I love it how when, when Bob the Boss says to Sleazy Sam, give me your account books, give me the books because you're fired, Sam doesn't say to himself, oh, I know that I'll be vindicated, I know that I'll be proved right. No. <laughs> it's almost like he's like, oh man, I'm cooked. <laughs> you know? He's like, the boss is asking for the Excel spreadsheets and all of that. I'm done for. I mean, it's, it's game over, right? Game over. His shady deals are now done. Or so we would think. 
You see, Sam kind of has this inner thought process going on that Jesus kind of lets us into. Where he says, I'm, 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 I'm too weak to dig. Maybe because this guy's used to the business world, right? He's used to business lunches. You know, that's the kind of world he lives in. He's not used to sweating in manual labor. And he also said, I'm too proud to bet. Well, yeah. I mean, you got to think about it. If, if, if Bob the boss is as rich as we think he is, and I think he is, looking at the debts that were owed to him, you can tell that Bob the boss clearly had a big business going on. I mean, he was a merchant of some sorts. I mean, it's a parable. It's all made up. So you can really say, say whatever you want about him, but he owned a lot of businesses. And so what that means is Sleazy Sam would have been pretty high up there in terms of the social ladder, right? You know? I mean, he's, he's probably the kind of dude with the suit and tie, you know, with the nice shoes, the guy that makes the, the, the wheeling and the dealing and makes all these things happen. And so that's the kind of world he's used to. He doesn't want to become a beggar. I mean, that's, that's a precipitous drop in terms of his socioeconomic status, right? No, you don't want to do that. Verse 4. Sam, good old Sam, has an aha moment. He's got a plan. I know what I'll do. And, and I want you to understand. Verse 4, when Sam has this aha moment, this serves as Jesus' main point. I mean, Jesus will make his main point out of verse 4. Okay? So Sam thinks to himself, I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job, people will welcome me into their houses. So, so there's, the, there's the plan. And so what does he do? He goes to his boss's debtors, and he cuts their bill by 50% or 20%. I mean, it's still shady, right? <laughs> it's, it's not legitimate whatsoever, but he does it. So that when he loses his job with Bob, these other two, and maybe a few others, will welcome him into their homes. What does that mean? Maybe he'll give, maybe, maybe, maybe Sam is hoping that they'll give him a job. I mean, I wouldn't hire the dude. <laughs> but maybe he's thinking, maybe they'll give me a job. Or maybe they'll let me stay in their home for a little bit until I can get my, my, my feet underneath me. We, we don't really know. But what does he do? He uses worldly wealth to gain friends for himself, so that when he loses his job, they will welcome him into their homes, into their places of business, and take care of him. Kind of a, hey, remember what I did for you? You think you can help me out here, right? Verse 8 is the surprise ending to the parable. It's the surprise ending. The manager, I'm sorry, not the manager, the boss, the master, commends him. You, you, know, you have to understand the irony of this, right? Bob is firing Sam because of his shady dealings. And yet, it was the very same shady dealings that is earning a commendation from Bob. Bob is impressed by this. He's like, wow, way to go. Way to, way to make this work out for yourself. And that's kind of the funny, I, I, ironic twist at the end, that the master actually commended uh, the manager for his shady dealing. Now, um, this is a, a very uh, odd kind of parable, because uh, some folks are thinking like, okay, so is Jesus telling us that we should be dishonest, <laughs> that we should be shady? No, no, Jesus is not telling us that. In fact, he's telling us the opposite. Instead, what Jesus is trying to tell us, and if you're taking notes, I encourage you to do that. If you're taking notes, Jesus is encouraging us to be wise. Um, the, the word here is shrewd in the text. You know, I think that's a good word. Be wise or be shrewd and use money for the greater good. Use money for the greater good. I want to make sure we all understand the 
connection. Uh, that's probably too small of handwriting for our type for many of you to read. I, I apologize. It didn't look this small on my computer. But I want, I want to read this out. So the manager used his boss's money through debt relief by reducing the debts of those who are indebted to his boss. The manager used his boss's money to make friends in the community. That way, when he is out of a job, these other business owners will welcome him into their homes. I mean, this could take the form of a place to stay for a while, or maybe even a permanent job. Right? So there's the idea. Now here's the connection. Here's Jesus' point. Jesus is trying to say that we would be wise to use the money that we have been entrusted with to make friends in our own community. So that when that money is gone, meaning when we die, because you don't take your money with you, when that money is gone, when we die, we will then receive a, a warm welcome into the kingdom of heaven. There's the point of the parable. It's not, Jesus isn't encouraging shady business dealings at all. He's, he's instructing us to be, to be shrewd, to be wise. And to use the money that we have to make friends so that we will receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of heaven. As, I mean, verse 9, Jesus gives the point of the parable. Look with me at verse 9. What does Jesus say? I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus isn't telling us to buy one another's affections. Instead, he's encouraging us to live in such a way that you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings by a throng of people who have been blessed by you. And so, that leads me to ask you a question. Who have you blessed recently? Who have you blessed? Who have you given a, a generous gift or a generous wage to? To whom have you shown generous hospitality or generous compassion? If, if Jesus were to come back now and we were to all go up to paradise, who would be among the crowd to welcome you because you befriended them here on earth through your generosity, through your kindness, through your compassion and hospitality? Let, let those thoughts kind of Run around and agree a little bit. Every year, one of our own, Chris, who I know is probably hating me right now for mentioning him, he's like, Yes, I am. <laughs> one of our own invites the whole church over to his house for Christmas. And Chris spends his time, his money, to make all of these amazing chocolates. I'm talking. Chocolate dip cherries, chocolate fudge, chocolate this, chocolate that. I mean, it is amazing. And every year, we know that Chris is going to be hospitable to the whole church. And I'm telling you, my kids love going to Chris's house. <laughs> they love it. Peanut brittle, the whole nine yards. I love it. See, uh, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging us to empty our checking I'm encouraging us to make decisions that bless other people. To go take the poor neighbor kid who doesn't have a decent pair of shorts to Kohl's and just buy. I'm not saying you got to buy them a whole wardrobe. I'm not saying you have to fix every, people's every single problem. I'm just encouraging us to take this passage to heart and to simply be a generous people. Well, pastor, I don't have much money. Okay. It doesn't take much money to bless someone else. It really doesn't. And, and when we choose to take what little we have and use some of that to bless someone else, I'm telling you, it's a beautiful thing because the power of idolatry is broken in that moment. It's broken. And we, we realign ourselves with love of God. So I want to encourage you to earn 
respect of the community. Earn the respect of the community. And I'm talking about Battle Creek, Kalamazoo, Climax, uh, Penfield, whatever community you call home. Earn the respect of the community through good stewardship and generosity. Work hard, be industrious, be shrewd, and contribute to the welfare of the community. I mean, that could mean starting a business so that you know, so that you can hire people. It could be any number of, of things. I love John Wesley's quote about, about uh, you know, earning all the money you can. Not so that you go spend it on all of your wants and needs, but so that you can save all you can and give all you can. You see, I think that's really in line with what Jesus is trying to tell us in this parable. I think Jesus is encouraging us to engage in the economy of this age so that we can, so that we can improve other people's situations and make friends for all eternity. You know, we live in an economic system that is unique to our time and location, right? And I think Jesus is encouraging us to be wise within the economic system so that we can benefit others. You know, I, I think about how some people say that capitalism is evil. I, I don't think capitalism is evil. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think people can be evil. But we are called to work within the system... And do the best we can with what we've got so that we can then bless this world, so that we can bless other people, work shrewdly within the system, and advocate for the poor. I want to show you a picture of, of what a local church did to just bless the community. Um, I hope you can see this. It's a, it's a flyer from Victory Life Church. Many of you know about this local church. And they had these flyers out for all of Battle Creek. Any drink on us. You go to a big beat and Victory Life Church is going to pay for any for a drink for uh, anyone in the military, anyone in public safety, and anyone in the EMS professions. So those kind of first responder professions. Um, it was in memory of 9-11 and what happened on the day in 2001. It was Victory Life of a church. It was their, that church as well bless the community and say thank you. I was really impacted by that because it showed me that this church gets it. This church gets it. They, they understand the power of generosity. They basically wrote a blank check out of Bigby Coffee, a local business by the way. It's a Michigan based business. They basically wrote a blank check to Bigby Coffee and they said look, any, any, anyone in the military, uh, public safety or emergency medical services, anyone there in, in, those, in, those, in those professions, they come to Big B, they get a drink, they're going to pay for it. You know, it sounds a lot like another parable that Jesus told, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember this parable? Where the Good Samaritan took the man who was beaten up and bruised to the inn, and he said to the innkeeper, take care of him, attend to his medical needs, and what did the Good Samaritan say? Here's some money. If it's anything above and beyond it, I'm good for the rest. A blank check to the community. See? What is Victory Life doing? They are making friends in the community. They're letting the community know that there's a church that loves them. And that just wants to simply bless them on a day when we remember what happened. Um, a horrible day. See, I think our, our way of doing that largely is through our food pantry. And I know a lot of us are going to that. And, and it's so true. And by no means do I want to minimize the ministry of the food pantry. But, but, but hear me out. I don't want us to use the food, the food pantry as an excuse to not do more. That, that's, the only, that's the only point I want to make. Is I, I'm just I'm concerned. I don't want to. I, I, we have an amazing ministry. The food pantry ministry is amazing, and you all know how much I love what's happening through that ministry. We're really broadening and doing new creative things. And all I want to say is let's continue in that way. Let's continue doing that. Let's continue being creative. Let's continue branching out. Let's not say, oh, well, we offer a food pantry the second, fourth Wednesday of each month, so we're good, right? 
some attitude that we want to have. But we want to continue to be thinking about ways that we can bless our community. Um, we're celebrating the fact that we are debt-free. Fantastic. And we're going to have a little bit more money now every month to be able to spend in different ways. I know all of us have been talking about wanting to bring on a part-time youth pastor and using some of that money to help fund a part-time youth pastor. That's excellent. But we need to also continue to think about the way we're spending money. Is it going to help us make friends in the community or not? And that's, that's always got to be a thought that, comes, that goes into our mind. I want to give us a negative example of what we're not supposed to do. It's, I know, that sounds fun, right? Oh, good. Okay, Pastor, give us a negative example of what we're not supposed to do. But it's powerful because it helps to instruct us. It comes to us from the book of Amos. Amos chapter 8. But hear this. Alright? This is Amos chapter 8. This is Amos the prophet speaking to the people for God. Alright? That's what prophets do. Hear this. You who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. Saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? You skip on the measure, you boost the price, you cheat with dishonest scales, you buy the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The sweepings were the chaff, that was the rubbish that no one needed. They were cheating people. The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob. I will never forget anything they have done. That is powerful. You see, the Lord uh, is very clear that we as a people of God are called to be a people who revere God first and foremost. Notice the way they talked about the New Moon Festival, which was a religious festival, or the Sabbath. Notice the way they talked about the Sabbath. They were like impatient children who are waiting to play with their Nintendo. I know a little bit about that. When, when, when can the Sabbath be over? When can this day be done so that we can go out and make money? So that we can go out and, and do our business? They had no reference for God. They were unwilling to just pause. Pause for a day and worship the Lord. They were unwilling to do that. And in our culture, we have to be very careful of the same thing. Um, how many times have I heard someone come up to me and say, Pastor, I'm so sorry that I'm not in church, you know, but you know, they, they pay us double time for Sunday, and, and so I'm going to go work and, and miss church. I've heard that a lot. And, and look, I get it, you know, you feel like you need to do it maybe once or whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to be here to judge you, right? That's not my job. God knows your heart, but, but if you're getting yourself in a situation where week in and week out you're missing church so that you can go make time and a half or double time, you've got to start asking yourself, who are you really serving in life? Who is your God? Well, but Pastor, I, I need the money. Okay, well, whoa, whoa. Why are your expenses so out of control that you feel like you have to do this? Right? Is this an income issue or is this an expense issue? See what I'm saying? Because I, I get it. I mean, that's what this, what this world incentivizes us sometimes to skip out on church so that we can make the extra money. But, but my friends, I just want to encourage you to resist the temptation and have reference for God. I mean, if, if all you do is working, 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 then, then you're basically selling your soul. What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Right? I want to show you a company that has really inspired me. And that is this one. Who loves Chick-fil-A? That's right. Hey, you want to go to Chick-fil-A today? No. Nope. After church? Man, Chick-fil-A. Um, actually, we were driving home after uh, uh, driving home last Sunday, and uh, uh, we were on the freeway. And I said to Melissa, "I said, man, I love some Chick Fil A." And we we're like, "Oh, that's right, they're closed on Sunday." And you know what? Thank the Lord. I think it's great because everyone else says you have to be open 24/7. You can't even miss Christmas or Easter. Everyone else says that you have to be open every Sunday because you're just not going to make any money if you're not open on Sundays. That's what everyone else says. But Chick-fil-A, because they are uh, 
Well, you know, I don't need to talk to you about who they are. You know who they are. They say, no, we're going to be closed on Sunday because that's the Lord's day. And guess what? Our workers know that every week they've got Sunday off. Our workers know that every week they can spend time with their families, with their friends, and if they want, they can go to church. Be with the church family. Do you realize how profitable Chick-fil-A is? So, I mean, it's amazing. It almost makes you think that, wow, there must be something to this whole thing that God's talking about having to have this There must be something to it. The Lord was very clear with the Israelites of the desert when he told them not to take up too much manna. He said, you know, you can take up double for in preparation for Sabbath, but that's it. If you take up any more, it's going to rot. And it did. God gave them what they needed. And God will give us what we need when we need it. Um, the concern I have is sometimes we can be so focused on making money that we injure other people in order to do that. And that's what Amos was talking about. How they were using dishonest scales and how they were selling the sweepings with the weeds. They were cheating other people in order to make their money. So I have a question for you. Who is your God? Is your God the Lord? Or is your God money? And you can tell by this. Are you showing reverence for God? You know? Are you giving God your time and your time? Are you, are you showing that God is your first love? But also closely connected to that, are you showing respect for your fellow human beings? Meaning, are you treating the poor with dignity? And are you honest in your dealings with other people? I encourage you to be faithful with the little money that you have. Because no matter how much money you have, it's little compared to eternity. Be faithful with the little money you have. Be good stewards of what money God has given into your care. Be wise with it. Be shrewd. Be smart. Be industrious. And as the Lord blesses your efforts, may you in turn bless the world. And Jesus is teaching this parable as if this life is practice round for the world to come. Did you get that? Did you get that? That's very interesting to me. And so Jesus is showing us that we are to be faithful now in this life. Because in the life to come, we are going to have a job to do. I, I don't fully understand it all. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what that all looks like. But, but this is what Jesus kind of says to us here. Number five, he gives us an if-then statement. He says, like, if you are faithful and generous with worldly wealth, and I use the phrase cash money, and here's why. Because Jesus is talking about cash money. He's not talking about spiritual, like, you know, don't spiritualize this. We're talking about legit money here, folks. If you are faithful and generous with worldly wealth, with cash money, then God will entrust you with true riches of the kingdom. True riches of the kingdom. What does that look like? What does that mean? I can't answer that. I don't know exactly what that means. But I believe that the type of person you are becoming today will be used by God's kingdom tomorrow. What type of person are you becoming? Are you becoming smarter? Are you becoming wiser? Are you becoming more generous, more giving today? Because if that's who you're becoming today, when eternity comes, God will use you with true, eternal riches. That's really cool to me. That's exciting to me. And so in conclusion, I'd like you to think about this question. Who do I love? And who do I serve? Wilson, do you have your wallet on you? You got any cash money on you? <laughs> what you do imagine? Everybody take out your wallet, would you? I meant to have it with me, but I forgot it now. Take out your wallet. Raise it up. <laughs> Who do you love? Who 
producer. Do you love this? Do you serve this? Or is this a tool? There's nothing wrong with this. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that money is evil. Jesus certainly didn't say it. Jesus never said that money is evil, that money's bad. No, it's a tool. I want you to think about this like it's a hammer or a shovel. My friends, you have a job to do to bless this world, to bless other people, to make friends for all eternity. How can you wisely use this to accomplish that mission? Bottom line up front, bottom line at the end. Use money, spend it on people, be generous with wages, be generous in gifts, be generous in compassion, be generous in hospitality, because this is fleeting and it is temporary, and one day it will be gone. But my friends, on that day, God will give you true riches of the kingdom. Amen? Would you stand with me as we close the word of song?
have a wonderful mission ahead of us. We have a wonderful job to do to be a people who bless this world. Would you extend your hands in the form of receiving the blessing? Oh, people of God, may the Lord bless you. I pray that God would bless you in your places of work. I pray that God would bless your finances, that God will pour out His abundance upon you. That is good. And I pray that you as the people of God would live simply so that you could be generous and kind, compassionate and hospitable. Oh, may you go from this place knowing that you are dearly loved. Go in peace. You are sent.